So in that case, like how important is the UX or let's say the product design, the UX aspect of the product? It's pretty important. Uh, you know, I think as a product guy myself, I can see good design. I've seen bad design too. Now mm -hmm. you can kind of somewhat overlook it if the tech is just amazing, right? Yeah. You know, like, oh, the traction's amazing. It's growing 40% month over month, but the design is like a three out of five. Yeah. It's just okay. It's just like average. Like you can kind of overlook it. But like how much design do you trade for how much traction? That's that's kind of like a, hmm. like, you know, like an investor question. I think I would trade, you know, five units of traction for one unit of design, something like that. It's probably a five to one ratio. So right. let's say I, I open up the, the product and it feels like I'm in like, Windows 95, <laughs> you know, and, but the traction is yeah. still growing 40% month over month. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Ignite podcast. First recording in over a month. I've been on vacation and traveling around. So very excited to, to have my first guest after vacation. Uh, Imran Sheik, he's a longtime collaborator of Team Ignite and he's had a lot, a lot of really cool product roles, has his own podcast. And he was emailing me some questions on fundraising uh, from, from a founder perspective. And I was like, you know, let's just have you on the podcast and, and talk about fundraising and we'll probably get a, a lot of good uh, Q&A. So welcome to the podcast. Yeah, no, thanks for having me, Brian. So I would love to, you know, kick it off so the audience uh, can get a little intro from you about yourself. In a nutshell, if I were to put it like, over the last 15 years, I've been doing product design. And over the last eight years, I've been more in SaaS, ad tech, martech data space. But how I got into tech was with our first company back in Pakistan. So I didn't even know it was a tech company, by the way. I didn't even know what the word startup was. So that was interesting. Uh, it was in a search engine place. So that was that. And then I got into San Francisco, you know, tech, got introduced into that. And here I am today. So, yeah. Yeah, that's great. So let's just kick it off. Like um, you're looking into doing a startup, it sounds like, and you're kind of had some questions about fundraising. Uh, yeah, let's, let's, let's get into it. So what was interesting is, so yes, I have already kickstarted a startup, probably will launch in a few weeks, but you know how that works. So, but then one thing, what, what's interesting is I was talking to a bunch of entrepreneurs who are raising, right? And what I'm also seeing from Carter perspective and everything. So I think you will be the right person to answer. You see more deals, you see the deal flow, you see the funding cycle. I guess the first question is in AI space, we know there are a lot of companies getting funded but who are these companies that's my question like i'm seeing some companies which have great team right but they don't have a product or maybe they have a product but no customer but the team so i'm trying to understand what are you seeing like let's start from there first yeah yeah i think it's a combo right if you're a first-time founder usually my advice is to join an accelerator right you have two or three co-founders ideally you know, you got the business person, uh, the design and the tech, right? Those are the three pillars of building great products, right? And so, you know, usually, you know, when I got started investing, you know, six, seven years ago, I was just looking at basically accelerators, you know, you go to YC yeah. Demo Day, you go to Techstars Demo Day, things like that. And that's still a pretty good source of deal flow for me. And now, I mean, with 130 portfolio companies and thousands of investors on Team Ignite, we get a lot of deal flow. <laughs> Uh, and, you know, over a thousand VC collaborators. So we get a lot of inbound, but I still, I still believe in accelerators. I think it's really great for first time founders to go out because they basically give you this, you know, 12, 16 week program of paint by numbers from idea to launch to raise. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, different accelerators will accept different kinds of teams and have different focuses. And yeah, I, and I think in the fundraising, to answer your question on the fundraising landscape, you know, it's you, you, you can see these five, like five million dollar seed rounds led by yeah. tier one VC because it's some open AI engineer that left with with their team. And now they're raising, you know, some crazy uh, amount of money and some crazy valuation. I think that happens because, you know, v, VCs kind of we invest in the future. Right. Yeah. Uh, we're kind of looking at what's the potential. It's not necessarily what what would the public markets bear on this thing right now, unless you're kind of like a Series D or E investor and you're kind of very close to the IPO. You're kind of looking at like how big could, could this thing be? Well, your comps for something like OpenAI are obviously it could be really big. Um, look at yeah. Grok with Elon Musk. Yeah. So when you have that kind of cachet, which is like tier ones of the tier ones, you're going to be able to raise 
a crazy amount of money. But what's interesting is most startups that exit on average take nine years from C- mm-hmm. stage. And on, on average, this is, these are averages. They exit for about $250 million, right? And so, you know, you have to kind of look look at things like if you're raising out of the gate at a $250 million seed, where's the upside? Yeah. Right? Because as a seed investor, I have to I have to believe it can go 100x. And so, uh, you know, for if I'm investing out of the gate at a $100 million valuation, I have to believe it can go to $10 billion, which is absolutely bonkers. Like how many companies make it to $10 billion, really? Yep. It's not, it's not a lot. It's a short list, right? And we probably know all their names. So it's like when you're kind of looking into being a first-time founder, you want to bootstrap as much as you can. That's really impressive to me. If I see founders that have gotten down the road, you know, hey, we've been bootstrapping this or moonlighting on this for the last seven, eight, nine months, and uh, we got it to you know five or ten k of MRR, and now we're just kind of raising a small little two hundred fifty k, five hundred k round to uh, kind of take the next steps and hit the next milestones. That's kind of like where you want to be. That's one way to do it. Another path is the accelerator path that I described. You know, this is the YC Tech Stars five hundred plug and play kind of path where, hey, we have two or three really amazing founders. We have the background. We have an amazing founder market fit. And now we're going to, we just need some guidance to go accelerate this thing. And we're willing to give up the, you know, 7% of our company for 125K because we know that at the end of the accelerator, we're going to be able to raise at a 10 or 15 cap. So yeah, that's kind of how I think about it. And so like, would you say like there were some companies, so I came across and I'm trying, this is actually pretty interesting what you're saying, because that that is something that I'm seeing more. So a lot of founders are doing bootstrapping, like at least to the words like MVP stage. The right teams are getting through that, try to find the product market fit. Maybe they have one paid customer, that's fine. But let's put it this way. So if there's a st- seed stage company that's coming up, they have the product, right? They may have a customer, maybe not, because you know AI startups could be costly to run. What do you think about that from that perspective? And what are you seeing in terms of deals i guess yeah and there's really like really four distinct pre-series a rounds now um it used to not be this way but it is this way now is you got your kind of bootstrap friends and family round which is like zero like a raise almost uh, almost nothing maybe 100k maybe 250k or nothing at all then you got this pre-seed kind of realm and that's kind of where team ignite is kind of honing out its bulk of its deals these are, you know, 500K, 250K on the low end, 750K on that, or even a million on the top end. And these are kind of like, hey, I'm post-launch, I'm post-revenue. I got, you know, 10, 20, 30K of monthly recurring revenue. I'm a viable going concern, especially in B2B SaaS. I'm default alive, which feels good for me as an investor. And then you got the the seed, right? And the seed is, is what A was 10 or 15 years ago. It's... Yeah. um. It's starting to be mostly priced or maybe half the time priced, you know, half the time on safe. And, you know, this is, these are bigger rounds, 1.5, 2 or 3, sometimes 5 or even 10. And then there's the the the, stamp, the real stamp of approval, which is the A, right? But in between that seed and A, there's also, there's also the seed extension thing, right? Which is like, hey, we didn't quite 4X our revenue. We didn't quite get to 2 or 3 or 4 million of ARR. And now we need to um, kind of extend this. We have a plan in place. We think we can get there. As an investor, I kind of shy away from seed extensions a little bit. And what's funny is I'll see companies raise, especially with the the hangover that we've had over the last two or three years. They raised at sky high valuations, and now they're raising priced, you know, seed extensions or seeds at a reduced valuation. So it's something I, I pay attention to as an early stage investor. Is like. Oh, you're racing at a, at an eight cap, and you have like a thousand dollars a monthly recurring revenue. Like, I just saw a company has a million of ARR raising at an eight cap. So, why would I invest in your company at an eight cap? Maybe a two and a half cap or three cap with a with a grand of revenue. So, that's the other thing you have to think about. And and like so, when you look, so you so is that typically for the B two B SaaS space, or are you also referring the AI startups? Because in the AI startups, what I'm hearing, so I met this person i will not say who that was but it was an investor and i was like hey you know what are you looking into it and uh, just casual conversation he's like oh the ai talent is really scarce like there's barely anyone out there so if you get something we're gonna invest into that pre-money like a pre-revenue 
if you have a product launch and I'm like, oh, that's interesting. And then I see certain deals. I forgot what, which week it was when Carta posted something around that, the AI rounds and everything getting funded. And then one comment I got was also, if you're not an AI startup, you're actually like, it's tough for you out there. Yeah. What is your remarks on all of these? Like, it's a very, it's not even a question. It's a, so. Yeah. You know, we could have done an AI focus fund. You know, I led the AI category for AWS. I built a bunch of AI powered products. I know the space pretty well, but I knew as an investor, it probably wasn't, it wasn't a good asset class because it's getting bid up so high right now. Now we're probably on the other side of that, I feel like, versus where we were maybe a year or two ago. But yeah, I mean, for, for the last couple of years, it's been 2010 for, for most sure. fundraisers, uh, including venture capitalists and startups. But I think if you've been AI, it's like, oh, it's 2021 still, you know? But I think that's kind of starting to come down to earth. I think uh, there was a lot of crazy money being poured into foundational models and kind of that infra kind of model layer. But now people, I think, are are starting to realize that a lot of the opportunity, which I kind of called two years ago, is at the application layer. It's kind of the, you, you know, the foundational models will just become a substrate uh, on which compute runs. This intermediating, of course, kind of the EC2s and S3s of the world. But the, um, it's really, the, it's still the application layer where the, a lot of the value is created. Um, you know, a lot of the value can be captured at that kind of platform level, uh, you know, like the Windows, the Androids, but those are so few and far between as an investor. Like I'm, I'm, I'm lucky if I see one of those and I'm lucky if I get into one of those, but there's, you know, thousands of unicorns that have been created at the application layer um, that you've never probably even heard of. And so as an investor, I kind of, I, l I like to be there. And, you know, if I happen to see a platform deal, that looks good. Yeah, sure. I'll take a look at it. Infrastructure deal, oof, uh, it was a little, little bit more competitive there, but I'll take a look at it. But the application layer stuff, I think, is where a lot of the value is created. And when you look at the seed stage round, right? Like, do you prefer price rounds or do you prefer safe rounds? Because I've been seeing more safe rounds coming in. Like, what's what's going on in that space? Because the only reason I ask is, like, for me, it's our first time to see companies safe round evaluation, 15 million, 20 million may have some customers, may have zero customers, but they have a product, right? Yeah. What would you say? Carta has really good data on this. If you follow Peter Walker, who's been on the podcast, and he has a great Twitter uh, feed or X feed or whatever you want to call it. And he publishes the data that Carta has on these, right? Where price seed rounds are actually a little lower than, than safe rounds for seed. Because they're more rigorous, um, they involve a little bit more cost and due diligence and you know, safes are just a little quick, they're quick and dirty, right? Quick and easy. And so like as an investor, do I prefer one or the other? Not really. I mean, uh, I do like to have a disc, like a good, you know, 20, 25% discount uh, because I know that I'm probably going to end up converting, especially this environment at the next round at the current, at basically the valuation I'm writing, underwriting that safe app. And so just pivoting to a different question, something this up concerns me or doesn't concern me, but I'm like curious. This year we have election, right? Open question again. What impact can we see? Are we going to see something reduction? Like, so we're in July. Are we going to see the, you know, going down trend? Are we going to be uptrend or non-effective, especially for the AI startups, even non-AI startups in this case? I think there's so many moving parts. I think, you know, I... It, it, we got to get our deficit under control, right? We're running a $3 trillion deficit right now. Um, that's going to put a lot of pressure on the dollar, which is going to put a lot of pressure on interest rates, which puts a lot of macroeconomic headwinds on the entire economy, including startups and VCs. And um, so we got to get control of that somehow. I, I don't know what the solution is. Electing Trump, electing Biden. I, I don't know. Like I'm kind of indifferent. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I definitely, you know, Socially prefer Biden, but, you know, fiscally probably prefer Trump. But, uh, and I think a lot of people feel that way. And um, we, I, I think fundamentally we have to get money out of politics and have a different political system that rep more represents our, like a better choice architecture for politics. So we can have second and third runoff voting, ranked choice voting. So we can get viable third party candidates that don't have to get a major party nomination, but I'm delving way into politics there. Um, 
the I was like trying to yeah I was like oh, oh, oh my question was about fun. <laughs> yeah uh, I, well, I've been thinking about the, those things for for a long time now especially once Citizens United uh, was the Supreme Court and all that you know back in 2009 you know so I think the long term trend is more value creation GDP growth and things like that I think what's dangerous for the U.S. right now is the pressure on the dollar you know you know, economies around the world are starting to think about how do I get off the dollar? You know, interest rates are really high there. Inflation's high. So we get to get inflation under control, which hurts everyone. And then, yeah, we got to figure out how to keep that under control without having high interest rates. So do you think that will hurt founders who are trying to raise like July? Yeah, I mean, that's that's what we're experiencing is sort of the the hangover from monetary easing during COVID and, and post-COVID. And, you know, this kind of run up of venture capital and the hangover from that. And, you know, I think we might look at back at this as like kind of 2002 and three uh, or, or 2009 and 10. Paradoxically, great time to be an investor, really bad time to be a fundraiser, right? Both as a VC and a, and a founder. So switching gears a little bit, because um, so you're giving me good insight on like the founder side you know, ventures, investment, just switching a little bit just to understand more psychology because a lot of founders don't worry about like VCs need to return to their LPs. That's their business, right? That's who they're, in a sense, founders are the product to them you can sell, right? So in terms of that, how hard is it for right now VCs who have actually raised, so there's some uh, venture capital I heard, they raised like a good amount of money and now they're looking for deals. They're literally reaching out to founders, what are you seeing in terms of like activity over there? Like those who have already raised, they have a new fund, they're looking for deals. And those who are trying to raise LPs or, you know. Yeah. So I guess the question is, you know, for VC, let me see if I can repeat the question. If if VCs have raised a bunch of money, what do you what kind of activity do you see them doing? Well, yeah. they were kind of on the sidelines uh in twenty twenty two especially. And then that started the thought in twenty three. And I think in twenty four we're finally kind of starting to see. Uh, especially in Q1, a little year-over-year -year quarterly growth in venture capital dollars deployed. So we'll see how Q2 ends up. So that's kind of the macroeconomic perspective. Um, yeah, I, I don't I don't know because I've only ever had a fund during this contraction. So I don't know what it feels like to have a fund when everything's, you know, all the money's loose and flying around. I had a syndicate uh, when that occurred but i never I've never had a fund when it was like flying high and easy to raise so my that might be the best kind of situation for me because i've only ever raised and deployed capital in a very headwindy kind of environment that's good no this is good for me because again i'm also like thinking as a founder like what would be important for me so here's what i'm learning brian is like have a great team have a great product try to get some customers what happens at this event uh, uh, really interesting Let's say you have a great product, great things, but it costs you to get customers. Let's say if you're in um, an AI startup, because the only reason I'm saying is that's the cost where I'm seeing a lot of companies coming through as well. How do you deal with that? Should they be raising because they have an A team or they have a, like a pretty good team, experienced team, right? Like how would, what would you think of that as a VC? Yeah, I mean, we look at about 15 different things when we're making an investment that we've written articles on. And every startup's different, right? You can't, there's no hard and fast rules in venture. There's lots of exceptions. And so like, if it's an amazing team, they're on their second startup, they exited their last one for, you know, nine figures over a hundred million dollars, then you're kind of like, here's some money, you know, go for it. I, we trust that you'll kind of do it again. If that's not the case, then you're kind of looking at all the other things. Uh, for me personally, traction's like a must-have, right? Like if you don't have that, then I'm, come back and talk to me when you have traction. Now, okay, let's say you have traction. There's kind of like four tiers or four quartiles of traction. You got your, and the, the, it's roughly like 10, 20, 30, and 40% monthly growth, right? If you're over 40% monthly growth, depending on kind of, you know, what the what the baseline is, you're in like the top core tile. And I've seen companies that have 50, 100% monthly growth. It's like, okay, interesting. And then you're kind of like, okay, what's going on here? And you're looking at, okay, what's your distribution advantage? Like, how are you acquiring customers? What's sort of your unfair advantage here? And and I've run into companies that just really have unique ways of acquiring customers. 
like, oh yeah, that's interesting. Like you're kind of doing this to, to do this, create this viral loop. And it's like unique. And as a growth hacker myself, you know, I used to run demand gen teams for startups a long time ago, more than a decade ago now. I'm like, oh, that's, that's, that's unique. That's cool. Right. And then you're like, okay, well, okay. So you have a distribution advantage. You have the traction. Um, why is it the right time for this? Are you too early to market? Right. It's hard to be too late. Right. If you're, you know, Google, 17th search engine, you know, you're kind of going around the valley pitching angels and they're like, oh, I'm already in Alta Vista and Lycos and what, what, whatever all the other ones we've forgotten are. Yahoo, I guess. Yahoo is big, but they weren't really. Then ask.com, yeah. dogpile. God, they were like a lot. <laughs> yeah. And so you're kind of like, as an angel investor, you're like, why? Um, and what's, what's the technological unlock there would be the answer. So why I like being a, high, a higher volume investor because I can, I can place multiple bets in a category and um, I'm not you know, on the board or anything of any of my companies. So it's not like I have privy information that I can share with others or whatever. And then you're kind of looking at all the other things. Why is it the right team? You know, are they chasing valuations? Are they tr like visionaries trying to build something for the long term? And, and then you kind of go down the, you look at all the other things. But traction for me is like, it's like the base of the pyramid. You have to have that. You have to be, and especially because software is so easy to build now. You know, you should be able to hack something together with two or three co-founders and get people to pay for it. Now, this this is actually interesting. And I think Tractions at least have something which says, you know, there's a pipeline, there are people coming in, they're trusted, you know, they're buying, at least have two, three customers. One last question, design. This is something, of course, core to me. So I have seen so many companies, Brian, and you are a VC. You see more companies that actually have probably seen in my life right now so yeah. 500 a month at least 500 a month yeah so it's only like 20 a day 30 30 days a month you know i take some days off so maybe 25 days a month so in that case like how important is the ux or let's say the product design the ux aspect of the product it's pretty important you know i think as a product guy myself i can see good design i've seen bad design too now, you can kind of somewhat overlook it if the tech is just amazing, right? You know, like, oh, the traction's amazing. It's growing 40% month over month, but the design is like a three out of five. It's just okay. It's just like average. Like, you can kind of overlook it. But like, how much design do you trade for how much traction? That's that's kind of like a, a you know, like an investor question. I think um, I would trade, you know, five units of traction for one unit of design, something like that. It's probably a five to one ratio. So let's say I, I open up the, the product and it feels like I'm in like Windows 95, <laughs> you know, and but the traction is yeah. still growing 40% month over month. And I'm like, yeah, I kind of still need to like look at all this stuff and figure out what's going on. And every startup's like a beautiful snowflake. So you got to kind of like look at all the, the structure of that startup, all the crystalline snowflake structure of that startup to figure out, does it still make sense to make this investment even, even though the design is crappy? But I'll tell you this, like, you know, you never get a second chance to make a first impression. It's kind of a, you know, a saying, cache, right? And it, I think it's true. And design lets you put your best foot forward. If I get a deck that's just well-designed, it starts with the deck, right? If, if you're pitching an investor, you should, the first thing an investor is going to say is send me the, de the deck or fill out this form. And it's the deck. And that's the first thing they look at, right? I actually do look at, I have a form for pitching me and I actually do read all the responses and then look at the deck. But, you know, most investors just look at the deck and if they open it up and it's, it's a shitty deck, all your other stuff is going to have to look amazing. All your metrics and team and all the stuff. So design, I think, is really important. Yeah. No, no. Uh, thanks for answering all my questions, Brian. Th this is really useful for me. Yeah. Anything else you want to talk about? This was kind of for you and for all the founders out there, uh, rather than us having a 30 minute Zoom call and 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 just talk i was like you know what we could do a 30 to 60 minute podcast and and just talk about these these issues i think like the only reason i was asking these questions is because i'm hearing a lot of conflicting opinion in the market and i think what you have said does make actually not even sense like it's, it's to the point it's why you're in the business you know it's like if you start up you need to have a business you're not here like building playland right and so I think that is something that helps me out. No question as such, because I think I'm more, but I think this is something that you also echoed as well. Like 
if you're an AI startup, you're probably having an easy time. Easier time. Yeah, but everybody's an AI startup, right? It's kind of like saying I, work, I, I use databases or the internet, right? Of course you're going to use AI in your app, like at, in yeah. some way, shape, or form. Now, how AI forward is it? You know, is it gonna, is it like perplexity or adept or, you know, anthropic? Is it like that level of AI where it's some sort of platform or foundational model layer? Or is it, hey, we're, you know, like we're using AI. I have a portfolio company called Sonia that uses AI to... Uh, deliver cognitive behavioral therapy at scale. And that's a really cool use case, right? Like, hey, we can use, we can fine tune these AIs now to help people like get through their problems and suffering and PTSD and stuff. Or I'm, you know, building a um, AI for a uh, co-pilot for patent lawyers. Very specific audience, right? It's like, um, it's, it's more like, you know, how LinkedIn is using its AI. It's, it's so bad. Not that I want to poo poo LinkedIn, but it's, it, it's. What are they doing with their AI? This is funny because my my wife worked at LinkedIn, so. Um. So so what they're doing is like you can see all these auto suggested questions, and they're so bad. Like it's like so if I want to connect to Brian, I don't know Brian. They will actually pop in. Hey, just send this message and it's like, hi Brian, nice to meet you. It's been a while. We connected. I just connected you right now. How is it a while? And it's that's one example. They have these comments which are very generic as well not i'm not again uh, they'll figure it out did you see the meme going around on, on x it was uh these uh, these uh, this these ais are running amok they're just out of control and it was literally a like a post on linkedin with 32 of the exact same comments you know yeah i agree you know uh this is really <laughs> that you know topic is really important to the leadership blah de, blah and it was like the exact same topic and somebody was deploying like AI just to auto comment on people to try to build relationships. And so it's like a misuse of AI. It's a big, you know, what's even worse is, you know how they have in LinkedIn, the community badge stuff going on. So me being curious, I'm like, you know, I'm just going to randomly copy this person. And this person is a big influencer on YouTube. And I don't want to name that person. And I copied, put it in this AI detector. Guess what it said? AI written. I'm like, geez, you're literally copy pasting the question and putting in GPT and then spitting it out. So I think there's a lot of issues happening there. Well, yeah, I've seen platforms now for creators where they use AI to respond to comments because some of the big creators that have millions of followers, they have thousands of comments per day. They can't read them all and respond to them all. And Yeah, that makes sense. But so you don't want to do it for like community badges or when you know where you're contributing to the content it's just ridiculous but going back to your thing it's like i think uh what i was trying to say is like yes there are a lot of companies that are trying to be ai versus they are trying to be llm agnostic or trying to build a knowledge base leverage G gpt or whatever you have or slms you know trying to figure out how you can use to accelerate human capital or accelerate human productivity that's a different thing versus like uh, I'm into Qualm. I'm going to introduce AI bot because GPT is there. You know, so it's not really AI. No, no, no. That's an interesting one. Now, I guess the questions that you answer just makes sense from what you said. I'm just trying to think if there's anything burning for me. Yeah, I think that the the general takeaways here for anybody listening that's a a founder that's starting their startup, especially first time founders, get the complementary skill sets in your co founders. Right, because the more co-founders, the better. Uh, up until a point, there's it's like a U shape, right? One co, one founder, not so good. You know, maybe five or six founders, not so good. But like two, three, or four, somewhere in there, and have complementary skill sets. Have a story of like why you, why now, what's your unfair advantage? Why, why are you like trying to build a like a long-term sustainable business? You know, th this stuff takes fifteen years. You know, twenty years. You're gonna be at this for a long time. So make sure it's the right thing for for the team, and then join an accelerator, any accelerator, um, any any good one, you know, tier one, tier two, uh, and I would uh, obviously YC, TechStars, Launch, and there's lots of other ones that I'm not, you know, 500 plug and play, lots of other ones I'm forgetting. That sorry for any accelerator partners out there, I'm forgetting that I've partnered with, but and there's lots of regional ones, and there's vertical specific ones. They're going to teach you a lot, and it's it's worth it, especially the first time around. And what one one thing is, like, do you think founders should reach out to syndicates also when they're starting, 
pre-seed or seed or because I know you you have a very nice healthy syndicate right like that's something I had that's how I connected to you S syndicates are yeah that's how we we found each other the team ignite now is thousands of people like you and from industry that want to you know throw some of their resources and money behind some startups syndicates were a lot easier to raise three years ago in in 2021 they're much tougher now I think my failure rate for syndicates is, is rather high, probably higher than the industry average, honestly, because I don't do all the, the, the sleazy marketing stuff that other syndicates do, you know, and you see it, right? Like, I don't know what you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, yeah. It's like five <laughs> or six emails, five or six days in a row about, oh, we're last money in. Oh my gosh, this happened. Oh my God. Like, and it's just like, it's like a, like a pumping the syndicate. I don't do, I, I've actually learned to, it's just, it's one and done email for me. I used to I used to barrage my 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 syndicate with multiple emails like oh you gotta like invest in this it's so amazing they just like doubled the revenue and like I just like constant like emails that I've learned it's like it's one and done just like Jason Calacanis says it's, it's like deal number three hundred and like here's all the details and if you want to invest great you know half the time it doesn't work and that's fine what what's interesting about syndicates is they work really well when you have a lead investor it, it, it it's a catch twenty two almost it's kind of like I'm successful in my fundraise, so I don't need a syndicate. But yet now the syndicates come knocking versus I'm not successful in my fundraise. I need syndicates, but they can't fill it because I'm not successful. And so you actually have to have a really strong lead. I've, I find the the ones that feel the easiest, I have some sort of name brand VC um, and crazy traction, cra awesome team. And those, those will fill, right? Or like, hey, this is a follow-on from our previous... If you're in our fund, you get a discount on the carry. They just forex their revenue year over year. We're lucky to have an allocation. It's that kind of positioning that really helps to fill a syndicate. And look, oh, look at this tier one VC leading the round versus like, hey, I just started up. I started out. I'm a founder. I have a thousand in monthly revenue and I have, I'm raising a million and I have 50K raised in the round. Like that's, that syndicate's not going to work. You might as well not even try. Somebody told me, uh, I won't name names, but. Uh, this is years ago when I was just doing my syndicate and I was kind of explaining or maybe complaining about how my syndicates were filling. He goes, well, you're not really investing as a syndicate lead. You're just equalizing access. And I thought that was a really interesting framing. And a lot of, a lot of founder, a lot, a lot of investors, a lot of people on team ignite even don't realize that the best, the best deals never see the light of day in syndicates. They, they get filled up. You know, somebody swoops in, takes two or three million of the round. They say, "Hey, you can raise another five hundred k from value add investors and angels," and that's it. And then the best. This is why we did our YC fund in the first place. Is we were syndicating YC deals, and the best ones w would get filled up like within a week, like three weeks before demo day. I couldn't syndicate them, and they had they were growing one hundred percent a month. And I, you know, we were lucky enough to get into some of those, like some of those syndicated deals, but like a lot of them we couldn't. And, you know, or the valuation would change. Oh, yeah, that was our first tranche. The first million was at 10. And now we're on, you know, we're on tranche three. So it's a 25 cap. And I'd already raised 100K in the syndicate. And so now I have to go back to the LPs and a lot of them would cancel and I wouldn't have enough to close, especially on AngelList, which has like 100K minimum. And their fees have gone up, which is why another reason I don't run on AngelList anymore. Yeah, so that, that's why we raised the, our, our initial fund, our little rolling fund. Because it was just so hard to syndicate. Easier to, you know, spot something that's gonna escape from your your clutches in a few days if you don't like sign that safe and wire right away, and have the dry powder for it. That's true, and and and, and you know, it's it's I like what you're saying because this was my thoughts that I was thinking. If a startup is reaching out to syndicate, how healthy are you? You know. Like most likely, like the three companies I've worked with when they were startups, they had the lead investor they introduced to their friend investors and the deal was closed. Yeah, it's, it, there's kind of like a, a, a negative quality signal um, as you go down the stack, right? You got your tier one VCs, you got your tier twos, you got your tier threes. Then you got like maybe your tier one syndicates, right? That kind of maybe co-invest tier two syndicates. And then you have like public, like we funder, start engine kind of funding which is a super negative signal. Like that means like you could not fill your round with any of the other sophisticated investors. And now you're going out to like the retail public to invest like a thousand dollars each or $500 each at scale. And it's a, it's a huge negative signal. That being said, there's 
lots of quality deals in syndicates. This isn't a hard and fast rule. It's just, you know, buyer beware, you know, like do your, do your research and make sure that you're investing in the right things. And, you know, if you're an angel, like that's a great way to get started. If you can't write 25K checks and, and get direct loan cap tables, you can write these little one, two, three K checks and put your money where your mouth is and kind of learn your lessons. Cause I've taken a lot of lessons over the years, you know, investing in the wrong of things that I was like, Ooh, I shouldn't have done that. But you know, I only had one, two or three K on, on the line. So that, that was, that was painful. It's like the equivalent of pushing all in on a poker table and going, ah, I, you know, I had pocket sevens. I shouldn't have done that, you know, but you, you learn. And, and do you think like there are more secondary deals that are pushing through like syndicates more often versus like, Oh, don't get me started on secondary deals. Oh my God. That's like that. I mean, the SEC is going to have to step in at some point to kind of stop this because what you now what you're doing, it's kind of the same problem that you have as a startup employee, right? You kind of get this offer for some shares at some price, but you don't know, like, is that price good or not? It's 52 cents a share. Is that good? Like, what's the valuation? Like, what's the revenue? What's the multiple? Um, what's the growth? Like, you, you actually have no information. And then now you start talking about secondaries and you're like, oh, okay, I'm buying Stripe. Okay, great. Right, what valuation are you buying it at? Are you buying it at a $100 billion valuation, $80 billion valuation? Um, do you know what the public markets will bear if this thing IPOs? And so it's it's almost like preying on this like long tail of credit investors that are just sophisticated enough to do a secondary, but not sophisticated enough to like know what DCF means or, or, or know what a good PE ratio is for that kind of company in an IPO. Right. Um, yeah. I don't like secondaries at all. Because the only reason I'm asking this stuff, not, not to, not to retail investors, like secondaries between VCs, like, Oh, I invested at a five cap and now they're raising at a billion. So I got a 200 X minus dilution. I'm going to trim some of my position in a, in a future round. I think that's fine. But when you start going like syndicate upon syndicate, upon syndicate, upon syndicate, layers of syndicates, sending out secondary deals, it just kind of, it's kind of fuzzy, you know? Because, because the, the only reason I'm asking is like, I feel like it's kind of polluting the syndicate space with startups, helping them out. Like I'm thinking of like this, if I have a deal of Stripe, let's take that as an example. And then I have a deal of this, new AI startup, Stripe, right? Like if I'm putting the same out, like they will be, I'll, I'll better put my money. To Take management fees on these syndicates because of the, because they get some like allocation of some allocation, of some allocation. So they're not even investing directly into the cap table of the company. They're investing into another entity that has a portion of another entity, which is absolutely wow. crazy. So there's layers of management fees and carry involved in these multiple uh, like layered entities. And it's basically, yeah, you go raise three or 400,000 and you're getting a point a year for 10 years or a half point. Like you just paid yourself some money as a syndicate lead, but is it the best thing for the, that this private investor that you just raised that money from? Probably not. Oh, wow. I didn't know that. I actually didn't know that. Yeah. If you start poking around AngelList and start looking at some of the stuff and I, I apologize to anybody listening, that's a syndicate lead doing this. Um <laughs> But that's the, I'm just calling it how I see it, you know. I'm just calling. No, it no, how no. I that because that's something I was seeing too. Like, there's a this founder. He reached out. He's like, "Hey, I'm trying to raise, you know, 500k. I'm a question." The syndicates I reached out, they're mostly doing secondary deals, and they said they would. Well, that's what they can raise right now. So it's a it's a supply and demand issue, right? Uh, they can raise. There's a flight to quality in any macroeconomic kind of uh, headwind or contraction or high inflation GDP recession, stack, like whatever we're at. And so you, you, put, you, you start going, the money kind of flows to quality or perceived quality. That's important. Perceived quality, but actually the best deals are still to be had in the early, earliest stages. If you look back at the historic turndowns, those early stages performed extremely well in 2003 and 2010. Uh, and those secondaries did not, the later the stage, the harder that, that whip is right. The hard, like harder that the harder the fall there because those public markets just aren't bearing. If you look at SAS multiples, they're not bearing the kind of valuations that these secondaries are offering. I saw this post by, I think it was SAS star. He was talking about one company they were doing $700 million a year. And now the valuation is like $6 billion. And it was way really like, not exactly, um, what do you say? Forward looking in terms of like their market cap. And I was like, wow, that's that, 
the question is, um, will they recover? And then I was thinking, was listening to David Sachs. He was saying like, this, this is going to happen. This is going to come back. I guess next year, depending who wins. Um, just on a, going on a tangent a little bit. You mentioned one company and that was like debating should I ask you or not. Perplexity.ai, two, three years old startup. They have, I guess, their own ML model. Of course, they have to at this point. They're a billion dollar or multi billion dollar company. That whatever it is, I think it's $2 billion. What are your thoughts? Is it going to really kill Google or not? I mean, I've, I've, I've used them. Um, I sometimes use them when I need to get up to date factual correct answers with citations. Um, so that's pretty cool. Um, they also have the, the whole, uh, ignoring robots.txt, um, you know, scandal, it's, you know, and I haven't, I, I haven't followed the news exactly on that, but, um, you know, I think, you know, when Google came along, it's like, well, will it really kill Yahoo? You know? So I think when it happens, when somebody does finally kill Google, it'll, it'll be really apparent and really fast. Um, if it happens at all. Right. Um, Google's proving that it can kind of move quickly and, and ship and iterate. And it's, you know, it's a five alarm fire over there right now. So who, who knows? That's the crystal ball. I, but I'll tell you, like if perplexity came along with that team and their pre-seed or seed, uh, and I can invest at a reasonable valuation that wasn't like a hundred cap, I, I would place a bet. Now would I place a bet when it's worth billions of dollars? Probably not. Um, and, and maybe because it's just not what, like, it's not the kind of stuff I invest in. But I, I could tell you as an investor of pre-seed and seed companies, if I would have saw that team, I would have invested. But I can't tell you as like a like a late stage AI, would I invest? Yeah, yeah, no. I, because one thing, which, the only reason I'm asking about perplexity.ai, I love it. I actually use it very often. Um, but one thing I got is like, they actually got me two facts wrong. I was asking, doing some due diligence on some company, you know, trying to understand like what's the cycle, what's the revenue. And let's put it this way. The revenue it coded was apparently $10,000. Like, hey, this is what they charge. And it had a really good source. I even checked that source. And I asked the company, it was 10 times that. And as a founder, if you're using any perplexity.ai as a research, because that's the primary thing. It's a research engine. I've run into this all the time with PitchBook, Crunchbase, and other information aggregators out there even AngelList, um, their, their data is not as good as what the VC knows and it's not as good as what the founder knows. So that's, the founder has the ground truth, the VC is second to know through an update or through some integration. And then Crunchbase and uh, PitchBook and all, all the other public sources or semi-public sources are last to know. Um, and so what I'll actually tell my LPs is like, don't pay attention to AngelList, what they say, Here, here's the real data. I know from the founder, you know, and it, yeah, because the, the founder, uh, the founder also doesn't want to let let people know how well they're doing, which is why you can't syndicate everything. By the way, if you're a founder crushing it, if you're perplexity, seed stage, and you're just crushing it and growing like a thousand percent a month, I want to send that out to thousands of people on Team Ignite, you know, no matter how convincing I am, I'm pretty convincing, but not that convincing. No, because it, it, no, that's true. Because I think like someone like Perplexity, the way they've grown, there's a lot of good stuff out there. But then also my question, it, it comes down to this. Uh, later along, like killing Google or not, the question is where does it go? What is it going to become? And how fastly is it going to get adopted? I know they're doing enterprise. They even announced education today as well. So just curious as a VC how you think about it. And I think pretty honest about that one. But yeah, this I was really curious because a lot of companies I've met and founders say like, oh, we can do something like Glean, which is an enterprise search for AI. Yeah. What does perplexity really do? It's, it, it crawls the web like Google, creates an index, and layers on large language models to answer questions about the web. Google can do that very easily, and they're already doing it. Now the question is, can Google catch up and do it as well as perplexity? Yeah, probably. Uh, and then so what are we really talking about, right? Bing's also doing it with ChatGPT. And OpenAI is doing it with Bing. So everybody's kind of converging, right? And so like you probably end up with what you had in, in the search era, which is some major winner. Um, 
and some minor winner and a few scragglers. <laughs> that's true. That's true. No, this is a good one. That's a good one. And is it enough of a platform shift, you know, like mobile was um, or cloud was to really shake up the industry and allow for some new leader like AWS to come along or iOS, Android to come along? And then Microsoft got left out in, in, in the cold and, you know, Nokia and BlackBerry and all that, all, all those. Is it a big enough platform shift or is it kind of commoditized and you can sort of, you might be six months behind OpenAI, but you can kind of like, is that enough of a lead uh, to differentiate, perpetually differentiate yourself or is your, is your distribution advantage? Like look at Windows, like with Microsoft and all their surface areas. Like they've rolled out, rolled out like like I don't know how many co pilots at this point, like ten different co pilots across all their different surface areas. Um, they have distribution advantage, right? Yeah, yeah. I think with the only thing with Google is like they they really have a good play going on. I don't know if Sundar Pichai is the right person for this. He's a good business operator. He's a great business person. But is he reckless? Is he, when I say reckless, I don't mean in a bad way, but I'm like, okay, let's put it out. Forget, you know, DEI. And just for one sake, let's just put it out. What's exactly what's out there? Because there's a lot of like. This is the diverse uh, founding fathers meme that was going around. Really funny, right? But they'll correct. They'll correct. They'll figure it out, right? I mean, that, and that's why they didn't roll out Chad GPT in the first place, right? Because it wasn't a deterministic answer that they could feel comfortable with. And, you know, these, you know, I've worked at Microsoft and AWS, they, these companies get so big that they, they get stagnant. This is the innovator's dilemma, right? Where something comes along, oh, that's a toy, that's not going to work. And then it slowly gathers capabilities to where then all of a sudden it's, you know, 10 times cheaper or one tenth the cost and just as good as the incumbent. And that's a scary place to be um, uh, if you're the incumbent and your salary depends on you, like, you know, printing money like Google's. Especially with AI, I do expect a lot of things will become easy to do. So basically execution might be a commodity. The question will be ideas will be very rare. So I think that is something that, well, that's what I take. I could be wrong because today it's very easy to build a startup, to be honest. Brian. Like when I did my last startup in 2016, it was like OnlyFans, but like cleaner version. It was called One Avenue. So helping creators to monetize, not in the dirty space, the clean space. And we grew to 6 million users, but after a lot of money spent, right? And that's not a place to be. But now today, in a few months, you can have something working out there, probably even make some money. Yeah, I've written some articles on this. It's kind of like what you might call the end of SaaS is existentially as an investor i think about this a lot at what point does SaaS software kind of dissolve into the platform layer of large language models where you just talk to this ai and it generates an interface in the fly generates apis in the fly the SaaS is just like an interface to like put data through an api layer into a database and retrieve it right and then like make some fancy like charts and predictive analytics on it and stuff um so at what, what point is it like this multi-purpose LLM that can just sort of retrieve all the data, uh, crawl all the tables, figure out what you need, anticipate your needs, generate the interface on the fly. Um, and at what point does that happen? It's, you know, the, my over under, my 50-50 is probably five years. And SaaS looks completely different. Now there's still like this, like what you're, what you're digging at, which is like, maybe there's no technological moats. Maybe it's just drive ambition and execution because people are still going to need to figure out what people need. But at what point does the AI figure out what people need and just build it? And then there's no people needed to figure out what people need. And then we're just kind of left like sipping our big gulps on a spaceship, right? It's it's an interesting question, right? Maybe we're just sitting here on podcast talking about what all the AI is building. Yeah, because the one thing is like I commonly, so I'm doing these customer interviews, Brian, and they're like, oh, will I get replaced by AI? And I'm like, look, but this, this is my thoughts that I could be wrong. You probably can tell me if it makes sense. The simple thing is if AI replaces everybody, uh, then how the world is running. We are like, how is everybody making money? How are they paying the bills? How are they even going out eating? People said that when they all worked on farms 200 years ago, right? Like if the factories are building everything, what are we doing? And if they're 
you know, the assembly line's building everything. What are we doing? And and I think we'll 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 invent new things to do, like Mr. Beast, right? Making I don't know how many hundreds of millions of dollars a year making YouTube videos. We'll invent new things to do and new ways to make money and new ways to create value. And I'm I'm reading uh, Ray Kurzweil's new book right now, uh, Singularity's Nearer, which I'm really enjoying. And I read I read his book 20 years ago, and people thought his ideas were crazy. And what he would say is, in the future, there's a spiritual reawakening. We merge with our AI. The AI accelerates us. It becomes part of our our brains. And so there is no like us and them. It's us. We it's just an extension of us. And uh, we're freed up to do more. And then there's there's kind of like some post scarcity, post singularity society of super abundance that. We're still doing things, but we're just doing things that we can't imagine right now because we have orders of magnitude greater cognitive abilities. It's it's like a, it's like trying to explain to like a like a mouse like what we do on a daily basis. I don't know. It's like a, it just scurries around with its very thin neocortex and and just finds food and follows like kind of pre-programmed cerebellum instructions, right? Yeah. No. 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 Because I think um, I, I actually agree with you because. I, with AI, I think people will love to do what they like to do. So let's say if you hate some lower level job or maybe the higher level job, you just pick what you love to do. And a, and a super intelligent AI will be able to counsel you. Like the best ca- career counselor, the best PhD level assistant in every topic, every field, it will kind of, it'll be able to find that thing that you uniquely are suited to create for humanity. That's why I'm, I'm you know, I'm a techno optimist and, I think the future is really bright as long as we don't blow ourselves up. I think in the end of the day, everybody can 10x themselves. That's what I keep telling people. Like AI will 10x. Maybe you will have less people hired, but 10x, like you have like 10 product managers, you will probably cut down to one because one is enough or two is enough. You know? Yeah, that's the solo entrepreneur thing, right? Where, whereas like I never hired anybody. I've just been working with AI to build things, build things I want to see in the world. Um, and yeah, that's a... Very unique world. So when when will the first? This is the Sam Altman headline, right? When will the first solo founder unicorn company be cre- created or minted? Uh, and they have a betting pool going. Um, and it can't be less than three to five years, but it can't be probably more than ten. Uh, and that's pretty pretty. I mean, you could argue that Mr. Beast was probably the first unicorn entrepreneur. We just don't think of him like that, right? He's more of a That's creator, true. but um, but the, they're talking in the traditional business sense. But anyway, I could t- I could chat about the future of AI forever. It was really great having you on the program. Thanks. Uh, I hope um, founders out there, especially on the first half of the program, got a lot of value, and and all you techno geeks like me got a lot of value in the second second half. So thanks thanks for coming on. Thanks. Have, thanks for having me. Bye.